Ready for more? Uh, let the minutes of the proceeding show that I re-entered the room at 3.00 and 12 seconds, true to my word. Okay, um, I wanted to give you one example of a screw axis that you're probably familiar with in everyday life. That was a telephone pole that I was very familiar with when I was a little kid because we used to love to wait until it got dark and our parents couldn't see us and then we'd climb up the thing and wow, you could see all over the whole neighborhood. Uh, surprised nobody said what? They had electricity when you were a little kid? Yes, they did. Uh, but now it's all underground, so kids, I don't know what they do for recreation these days. Um, okay, let me uh, pursue this question of screw axes. We've seen what a two sub one screw axis looks like. I just uh, uh, erased it, but it consists of objects of the same chirality extending uh, left and right on either side of the principal axis. The symbol for a two-fold axis is this. The symbol for a two-fold two screw axis is the symbol for a two-fold axis with uh, alternate sides extended like a propeller. It's sort of a very descriptive symbol. It's a uh, thing is rotating around, and you can think of these as the little ribbons that you used to have on the handlebars of your bike when you were a little kid, and as you pedal along, these things fluttered out behind, and it was really cool. Um, Okay, let's move on to the next family of screw axes. Um, and let me look at an operation A2 pi over three um, with a translation component tau. And these things are gonna get awfully cumbersome to draw. So let me use a device I wish I could claim credit for it, but actually a student in my class one year said, hey, I've got a really cool way to draw these things for you. Let's imagine if this is a screw axis, we put a cylinder of paper around the screw, and then um, let's divide up the surface of the paper in terms of uh, N segments. So if this were a three-fold screw axis, these would be 120 degrees. Uh, segments, and then let's draw horizontal lines on the sides of the cylinder. And then if we want to see how the screw axis reproduces a uh, pattern from a given motif, you just fill in these boxes, and then when you're all done, cut the cylinder, and uh, then you can draw the pattern quite nicely on a two-dimensional surface. So this is what I call the unrolled cylinder device. Somebody very imaginative invented it. The name, unfortunately, is lost to history, but I didn't want to claim credit for it myself. So what is uh, the pattern of a three-fold screw axis going to be? Let's let the difference between boxes be the translation component tau. And so what we would do is uh, take an initial motif, rotate it 120 degrees, slide it up by tau relative to the axis about which we're rotating. Performing the operation again would involve rotating 120 degrees, sliding up by tau, doing it yet again, brings us back down to the full circle. So this would be the translational periodicity along the direction of the screw axis, and this would be the value of tau equal to one-third of the translation. So that is what a three-fold screw axis would look like. And the pattern, obviously, if we would keep repeating it, would do something like this. So perfectly interpretable, uh, easy to draw. But things are actually more interesting and more complicated than this. We are stating two things about this operation. We're specifying a translation. But then the other thing that we're specifying is the translation component tau. And why should be, we be constrained to say that tau can only be one nth of a translation? If we do the operation n times, then um, 
doing the operation n times would uh, give us a total translation of n tau. But there's no reason why that has to be one translation. Why not two? Why not three? Why not four? So the only real constraint is that n tau has to be some integer m times the translation that is parallel to the screw axis. And this means that the value of tau is not just equal to one nth of, restricted to one nth of t. Tau can be m over n times t. And that is perfectly compatible. So you do the operation n times, you're gonna be directly above where you started. That's gonna be a translation vector. But why not two translations or three translations or four translations? So there are infinitely more screw axes than just the n subscript uh, something translation. So let's look at some of the possibilities. Um, for a th three-fold screw axis, tau could be equal to zero t. Tau could be equal to one-third of t. Tau could be equal to two-thirds of a translation. Tau could be equal to three-thirds of a translation, four-thirds, five-thirds, and so on, on and on and on. We could fill the whole board with possible uh, screw axes having different values of tau. Now, let me convince you, hopefully easily, that if tau is equal to 3 thirds t, tau would be an integral number of translations. In this case, one down here, 6 thirds t would be two translations. We're already going to have those operations in the pattern when tau is equal to 0 t. OK? So let me show you what I mean if that's not clear. Here's a trio of objects on either side of uh, the rotation part of the operation. So what I'm saying is if tau would be equal to two translations, okay, that would say that we're for some perverse re reason defining this as the uh, pitch of the screw. Okay. Is it clear that that is going to be an operation that I already have when I say there's a threefold axis and a translation T parallel to that threefold axis? That's going to give all sorts of screw operations, but they are going to be integral multiples of the translation that's parallel to the axis. So the rule is that we can always subtract off one translation from any of these definitions of tau and reduce it to something smaller. So we can always define tau less than or equal to t without any change or rest artificial restrictedness on the nature of the pattern. So that says that uh, for a three-fold screw, for a three-fold screw axis, there are only three that we should consider. Tau equal to zero, and that's a pure three-fold rotation axis. Tau could be equal to one-third of a translation. Um, and now we introduce the notation used to designate screws. Um, if n tau is equal to mt, the symbol for the screw axis is n, the rank of the axis, with M as a subscript. So the pattern that we just drew here would be designated 3 subscript 1. And that says automatically that the value of tau is equal to one third of the translation that's parallel to the axis. So the only other ones we have to consider besides 3 and 3 sub 1 is 3 sub 2, where tau would be equal to 2 thirds of t. Um, 
Let's see what that looks like by quickly drawing it out. Again, using this dandy little unrolled cylinder device. Okay, let's let this be my first rotate motif, and I'll take this as the value of tau, two boxes up. So I rotate, slide up by tau, rotate, slide up by tau, rotate, slide up by tau, and I'm back up here. Uh, here is my translation. Tau is equal to two-thirds of a translation. And my translation then should be equal to 3 halves times tau. But this is supposed to be the translation. And there's nothing in this box. OK, this introduces another very important aspect of the patterns produced by screw axes. And it's sufficiently important. We must use. First, the uh, basic uh, screw operation, A alpha tau. And the translation in terms of which we have defined tau. So use the spiral that you have defined by stating A alpha tau as the basic operation. But then don't quit. You're saying another thing, that tau is a certain fraction of a translation. And you have to use that translation to generate additional uh, objects in the pattern. So in this pattern that we've drawn here, this is supposed to be a translation. So I have to take this one and slide it up by t. I have to take this one and slide it up by t. I have to take this one and slide it down by t. So I'm using a different kind of shading to indicate the ones I produced by a alpha tau and the ones that I've produced from that helix by using the translation t. So this is the final pattern. It has a basic screw operation that's equal to 2 thirds of the translation. And it has a translation that's 3 halves of tau. So everything's fine. Yeah? For the very top one, you have colored in that seems outside the box. Yeah, well, it's supposed to be another row. Shouldn't that be a box lower than you Yes, it should indeed. Thank you. When your nose is right in the middle of the thing, sometimes you don't notice that as readily as somebody in the audience. OK, so that's the pattern of 3 sub 2. And now if we realize that we must use both the basic operation A alpha tau and translation to fill things in, it's clear that if we try to have tau greater than a translation, the translations, when we applied them, would give us a screw that had the possibility of being redefined in terms of a shorter tau. OK. Um, one thing uh, that is apparent if you look at this pattern is that 3 sub 2 produces the same sort of helix, but in an entomorphic sense. This one is a spiral that goes this way. And this one increases when we rotate in a clockwise fashion. So are they distinct? Yeah, they really are because you can have both the left-handed spiral and the right-handed spiral together in the same space group. I don't remember whether that's true for the three-fold screw axes uh, or not. I'm not sure, but I'd have to check that. Yes? It's really an anthropomorphic because they're all left-handed. Yeah, that's so a point. Minus one, isn't it? Good for you. I was about to make that point. The sense of the spiral is an anthropomorphic, in the sense that this one is a left-handed, a right-handed spiral. 
This one is a left-handed spiral, but they're not truly in antiomorphic patterns because if we start with a right-handed motif, this one also has a right-handed motif. So I should qualify that statement, which I was about to do. It's the sense of the spiral, which is an antiomorphic. This is not to say that one has motifs in it of one chirality and the other one has to have the opposite chirality. Yeah, I could do that. I could do that. Yep. And remember that we can add or subtract a translation at will from tau. And if I took a full translation and subtracted it from uh, 3 sub 1, I would get... No, I'd get tau equal to minus 2. No, it doesn't work that way. Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. It's the same tau, but in the opposite sense. Yeah. Okay, so what comes out of this is that there are three kinds, kinds of axes that involve a 120 degree rotation. Three, which we could view as three sub zero, three sub one, three sub two. The symbols that are used for them now, we know and love the triangle that represents the locus of a threefold axis. For 3 sub 1 and 3 sub 2, what one does is to extend the edges of the triangle. There's the streamers on the bike handle again. And if you look down on the pattern and use a right-handed spiral, then you extend the as streamers, the edges of the triangle that goes down into the board this way. And 3 sub 2 would it was in the same pattern, you would indicate by extending the opposite pair of the opposite set of edges. Okay. So, um, so you said that the groups? Yes, there is a P3 sub 1 and there is a P3 sub 2. And they are distinct space groups. So how can you distinguish uh, like the uh, You would find out where the atoms sit. And uh, in one case, the spiral would occur in a right-handed fashion, and in the other one, from a, in a left-handed fashion. And you can determine the position of the atoms unambiguously. Okay, let's do one that's more interesting, where the uh, rank of the rotation part of the operation is higher. And let's look at uh, fourfold screw axes. So here we would consider tau equal zero tau equal one-fourth of a translation, tau equal to two-fourths of a translation, and tau equal to three-fourths of a translation. So let's take our cylinder that was formerly wrapped around the rotation axis, straighten it out, And uh, I won't bother to draw the pattern for a fourfold axis, but for a four sub one screw axis, this would be tau, and that would be one, two, three, one quarter of a translation that's parallel to tau. Or conversely, so T is equal to four tau, or conversely, tau is equal to one quarter of the translation. So start with a first motif, rotate 90 degrees, slide up by one quarter of the translation, rotate and slide, rotate and slide. Now I've come full circle, rotate and slide. So this then is the pattern for the screw axis that I'll label as four sub one by analogy to what I've done with threefold screw axes. 
over here, let me immediately jump to 4 sub 3. And I have to be a little more stingy with the spacing of my boxes or I'm going to run out of room. So if this is 4 sub 3, turns out that tau should be equal to 3 fourths of a translation. And conversely, the translation should be equal to 4 thirds of tau. So that's the situation that uh, would obtain if one, two, three boxes gives me the length of tau and four boxes give me the length of the translation. Okay, so uh, again, I'll use different sorts of shading to indicate which way I've gotten this. I would rotate 90 degrees. I would jump up one, two, three boxes. So here's the next one. Rotate one, two, three boxes up, brings me to here. Rotate one, two, three boxes, brings me up to here. Rotating again, sliding up three boxes, brings me to here. Okay, so there's the basic helix. And tau is indeed equal to four thirds of the translation. But I can't quit yet. I've used the basic operation A alpha tau. Now I've got to fill in with translation. And according to my rule, the translation should be equal to four thirds of, um, I'm sorry, this should be, the translation is four thirds of tau. So this should be the translation running up uh, one, two, three, four boxes. So that's, and I'll use a different shading here that would fill in one here. One, two, three, four boxes up brings me to here. One, two, three, four boxes up would bring me to here. Go down by four, one, two, three, four brings me to here. And let me use still a different shading here. One, two, three, four brings me down to here. Uh, filling in quickly, one, two, three, four. Another one would sit here. One, two, three, four, another one would sit here. One, two, three, four, another one would sit here. And you can see what is happening here, that four sub three looks exactly like four sub one, but in the opposite sense. So it's the same relation as between three sub one and three sub two. Uh, what do we use as symbols? This is a four sub one screw. And again, if we look down on the pattern from the top, use a right-handed rule and extend uh, every edge of the square. That would be the symbol for four sub one. Four sub three is the same sort of spiral, but in the opposite direction. So we will, with a right-handed rule and going between neighboring uh, closest motifs, we would extend this, extend this, extend this, and extend this. So that's a symbol for four sub three. And that, let me come back over to here, that uh, is everything except four sub two. Again, I'll mark up a cylinder that's been split into quadrants. Draw reference horizontal lines. Now, if this is 4 sub 2, uh, and we define this as tau, then the translation, this should be equal to 1 fourth of a translation parallel to the axis. And conversely, the translation should be um, four halves 
of tau. So let's draw the pattern. Um, this is the first one. Rotate, slide up by tau. This is the next one. Rotate and slide, rotate and slide. Uh, rotate and slide again, rotate and slide. So this turns out to be the nature of the helix that is produced by a pi over two tau. But this is not yet a pattern that has the translational periodicity that I have claimed. That's supposed to be the translation, twice tau, up to here. So I would have to slide this one up to here. I'd have to slide this one up to here. I'd have to slide this one up to here. And, no, something's wrong here. One, two, four. I think I, I think I went too far up for one of them. This one was one, two, three. This one, I went up too far. Skipped one. Skipped. What did I do wrong? Two upper case on one. Hmm? The two upper case filled the case. The top of the wheel. Okay, let me let me do this all over again. Again, I can't see standing right on top of it. Okay, this is not a very good attempt to make it look easy. Okay, split this up into four quadrants. This one comes out quite differently, so I want to make sure I have it right. So this is my translation, one, two, three. This is the translation. And that should be equal to four halves of tau. So this then is my value of tau. It should go up two boxes to here. And that should be equal to one half of t. So I want to rotate, slide up two boxes, 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 rotate, and slide up two boxes. And now I have to fill in with translation, so I will take this one and go up one two, three, four translations, that's what I did wrong. I'm going to take this one and go down one, two, three, four translations. Take this one and go up one, two, three, four translations. Take this one and go one, two, three, four translations. Take this one and go one, two, three, four translations. And now, lo and behold, uh, what I have is one, two, three, four. Curious sort of thing. I have two motifs at every level and they are 180 degrees apart. So a force of one screw axis, force of two screw axis, produces a pattern that looks like this. Pair of motifs like this, 180 degrees apart. Pair of motifs skewed by 90 degrees to that pair. Another pair translationally equivalent to the first. Well, what is the chirality of this spiral? 3 sub 1 was right-handed, 4 sub uh, 1 was right-handed, 4 sub 3 was left-handed, 4 sub 2 was right in the middle. Is that right-handed or left-handed? The answer is it's both. <laughs> it's both. There's one spiral that goes up this way, and there's another spiral that goes up in the opposite sense. So it's both. It's a left-handed spiral and a right-handed spiral together in the same pattern. And the pattern for this screw axis, the symbol for this screw axis, if it occurs in a pattern, is every other edge of the square extended. 
Which do you extend? Well, it really doesn't matter because it's both left-handed and right-handed simultaneously, so you can use either one. Yes, I have a couple of questions here. Um, can you explain why you have different shading? Uh, I just wanted to differentiate the ones that I use. They're all the same, and where they come from doesn't affect what the basic pattern looks like. But I try to make clear which ones I got by using the operation A alpha tau. And for force of two, which I just did twice, once correctly, once incorrectly, these with this shading were produced by the operation of rotating and sliding up by one half of the translation. The other ones, the ones for which I use this shading, I filled in by using what the translation was, namely twice tau. Okay, so it's just a, a way of keeping track of what operations I use to produce everything that's in the pattern. Okay. And for four sub three, I had to use three kinds of shading. Okay. Yes, sir? Should I read into the fact that this is actually two superimposed two-fold axes separated by one half T? Yes, you could read that into it, and you uh, would be very observant. Because a four sub two screw axis contains a two-fold rotation as a subgroup. And since you were shrewd enough to deduce this, we asked the question with glide planes when we were dealing with two-dimensional plane groups. Is a glide plane a candidate location for a special position? In other words, if I move the atom directly onto a glide plane, is there coalescence? The answer was no. Suppose I ask the same question now of a screw axis. Is a screw axis a candidate location for a special position? No, the answer is sometimes yes, sometimes no. Well, only if it's only if that's a Yeah, so, so actually, if I move the atom, the first atom, onto the locus of the rotation part of the operation, I get pairwise coalescence. And instead of getting all of these, I'll have just a string of single atoms separated by half a translation, half as many. So that's a special position. I don't get the full number out when I throw one into the space group. Okay. Now, there are an infinite number of screw axes. Um, my old friend, the saguaro cactus, which has a 22, 19 to maybe 23-fold rotational component to its symmetry does not, if I look at it carefully, have the same thing on every one of these ribs because the tufts of spines spiral up like this. So a saguaro cactus, if I take the spines into account, doesn't have a 22-fold rotational symmetry. It has some sort of 22-fold screw axis. And I've never been determined enough to risk puncturing my finger by going down around a saguaro and seeing if there's some other tuft at the same level and whether it's a 22 subscript 3 or a 22 subscript 2 screw axis. But a saguaro cactus does have a screw axis as its, as its symmetry element. Okay, let us generalize on the basis of what we've done so far. For any screw axis whatsoever, crystallographic or not, we will have an n sub 1 screw, an n sub 2 screw, where tau is equal to 1 nth, uh, 1 half, uh, 1 nth of a translation, tau equal to 2 nths of a translation, and we will go all the way up to n sub n minus 1, n sub n minus 2. And always, regardless of n, the ones at either end tend to be spirals in an anamphiomorphic sense. An n sub 2 and an n sub n minus 2 are spirals. If you end up with an odd one in the middle, this has 
no chirality to the spiral. There's a, a left-handed one and a right-handed one. On the other hand, for something like two and four and six, um, the um, the ones at opposite ends of the series are are uh, are an antiomorph in the sense of the rotation. Um, for a six-fold screw axis, and I will pass out the nature of the pattern without taking time to draw it. Six sub one and six sub five are an antiomorphous. Six sub two and six sub four are an antiomorphous. And six sub three stands alone. Six sub three consists of a pattern of three objects on a triangle pointing in one sense, three on a triangle pointing in the opposite sense. This is the value of tau, and that is equal to three-sixths of the translation. So no left-handed or right-handed sense. Uh, six of two consists of pairs of objects separated by 60 degrees. Six of four, exactly the same pairs, but they go in the opposite sense. Six sub one is just a single spiral going up at inter with atoms at intervals of one sixth of the translation. Six sub five, a spiral in the opposite sense. Okay, with that, uh, let me pass out a sheet that has patterns done in a decent fashion for all of the crystallographic screw axes. Bear in mind that there are fascinating, interesting, and intriguing patterns for non-crystallographic screw axes. And let me say a few words about the symbols used in the space group for Glide points. Any question on this, by the way? I don't want to uh, beat it underground. Yes? Question on yep. uh, the symbols. How do you know which way the arrows point on the either triangles or squares? Oh, uh, uh, here? Yeah. Okay. Um, Probably the best thing to do is to look at the patterns that I just passed around, if you got one yet. If you look at 3 sub 1 and look down on it from the top and indicate the sense of rotation that gets you from the one above to the one that's directly below, your hand will, will curl around in a clockwise fashion in the little tails on the th symbol for the threefold axis trail out behind the way in which you're rotating. If you look at 3 sub 2 and look down on it, you would have to, using your right hand, rotate in a counterclockwise sense, and therefore the streamers go out again in the opposite direction. Same for 4 sub 1. There, every edge of the square is enclosed. If you look at how you have to rotate to get from the one on top to the one immediately below, using your right hand, again, you have to rotate in a clockwise sense, and therefore the edges that are elongated trail out um, in the opposite direction. And finally, drawn in a decent pass, uh, fashion are six sub one, six sub five, which are spirals in the opposite sense, six sub two, six sub four, pairs of things at uh, each level, and the level is one third of a translation, six sub three, triangles of objects at intervals that are equal to one half of T, three sixths of T. Okay, is that answer? That is really a convention of some higher order, but nevertheless it is a convention and it is consistent. Other questions about screw axes? Yeah. So in nature, is there a preference for the right-handed screws? That's like asking, is there something like a Coriolis effect in 
crystals. You know the Coriolis effect that if you're in the southern hemisphere, the water gurgles down the drain one direction. If you're in the northern hemisphere, the opposite direction. Um, there was actually a very famous scientist. Um, what was his name? I think it was Soray. Soray, so famous I can't think of his name. I remember his name, Soray. Uh, he developed a very famous uh, theorem in kinetics, and that was thermal migration. Migration driven not by a chemical potential gradient, but by a, a temperature gradient. And it's very difficult to measure, and only recently have been, people have been testing that theory and making measurements. He asked this very same question, and he said, I, I think it was potassium chlorate that he looked at, which has no mirror plane or inversion in it, so it occurs in left-handed, right-handed forms. He asked, is there something like a Coriolis effect that would give you more right-handed crystals in the northern hemisphere and more left-handed crystals in the southern hemisphere? So what did he do? He drew a lot of crystals, and he started counting. And he counted and he counted and counted, and he couldn't tell whether there was a difference, and counted, counted, counted. And still, after lots and lots of counting, still could not get a result that was statistically significant. And he went nuts <laughs> trying to do this. So I think it remains to be seen whether there is indeed a Coriolis effect in crystal shape. And that's true, it's tragic. We're all laughing at poor, uh, poor guy. But he, he actually, you know, he just couldn't stand it. He counted so many crystals. <laughs> that's a true, unfortunate story. Um, no, I don't think there is any difference between left-handed crystals or right-handed crystals. Remember my story about sugar and its chirality <laughs> and the little bugs that can only eat one chirality. Other questions of a less frivolous nature? That was not frivolous. That was a good question. Okay. Well, let's say a little bit about glide points and how they appear in space groups. Things were very easy in two dimensions because the glide plane was a glide line and everything had to be confined to a two-dimensional space. So we used a solid line to indicate a mirror plane, the locus of the operation sigma, and we used a dashed line to indicate the locus of an operation sigma tau, and tau was in the direction of the dashes. Well, I've given it all away with the little diagram that I passed around. Things are much more complicated in three dimensions. If this is the locus of a glide plane, and this is the direction of tau, in a space group, we could be looking at that glide plane in a total of four different ways. We could be looking at the glide plane from the side, edge on and perpendicular to tau. We could be looking at the glide plane edge on and along the direction of tau. Or we could be between these two orientations and looking at the glide plane edge on, but in between normal to tau and parallel to tau. And finally, we could look at the glide plane down from the top. If we view the glide plane from above, for example, suppose we have a monoclinic crystal and we put a glide plane in the base of the cell which has tau in this direction. The way you indicate that is with a little chevron off to the side. And if this is the direction of tau, you put a little barb on the chevron that indicates the direction of tau. So the three possibilities for a monoclinic crystal is that tau could be this way, in which case you use a chevron like this, or tau could be in this direction, and then you use a chevron with a barb attached like this, or tau could be a diagonal glide, um, in which case the atoms would be up and opposite chirality and down, and then back up again. In that case, you add a little barb in between the two directions to uh, indicate the direction of uh, tau. We put some labels on this this A and this B. This situation would be a tau that is equal to one half of B. 
In this case, tau would be equal to one half of A. In this case, tau would be equal to one half of A plus B. Uh, this is designated as a B glide. And rather than having the symbol M appear in the symbol for the space group, a B would appear. This is an A glide. And the A would appear in the symbol. And this is a diagonal glide. And that, for reasons that I have never found anyone able to explain to me, is called an end glide. I know of no language in which the word for diagonal begins with an N. But that's what it's called. Now, those same glides can be viewed from directions that are parallel to the plane of the glide plane. Uh, looking normal to tau is exactly the same situation we had in plane groups, so one uses the dash. If you're looking along the glide plane end on, but in the direction of tau, you use a dotted line. It's easy to keep straight, which is which. If there's a little arrow in there and you look at it from the side, you see a line segment. If you look at it from the end, you see a dot. So it's easy to remember this convention. If you're neither perpendicular to nor parallel to the glide plane, you just miss the two, mix the two symbols, so you use a dashed dot line. So those are the symbols for, for glide. A glide plane is something like a piece of wood. It's got grain to it, and the direction of the grain is the direction of tau, if you like. All right. Um, in the handout, I give you some examples of um, the way in which a pattern of objects that has glide in it would be uh, it, interpreted in terms of a geometric symbol. Uh, at the bottom right of the page, the left-hand diagram has atoms related by a glide plane in the base of the cell uh, where tau is running left to right. And so you have a chevron with an arrow on the right-hand branch. Uh, if you have atoms alternately left-handed, right-handed at a level and one-half plus that elevation, then you're looking at a glide plane edge on and down along the direction of tau. So you would indicate the locus of that glide plane by a series of, of dots. One other type of glide plane is possible, not for monoclinic, but for um, Glides for, for lattices that have a centered lattice point in the middle of the cell. Um, so this takes a special type of brevet lattice. Uh, and this would be a lattice, for example, that uh, had lattice points at the corners of the cell and another lattice point in the middle of the cell. One face of the cell is centered. Then you have not only translations A, B, and A plus B, which can serve as uh, directions for glide, but you have another translation that is not present in the primitive lattice, and this is one quarter of A, one, one half of A plus one half of B. And if that's a translation, you could have a glide plane parallel to the base of the cell and have tau equal to one half of one half of A plus B. Namely, have this little vector in here be tau. And the symbol for that kind of glide is D. And I do know what that stands for. That stands for a diamond glide. Because diamond, one of the very simple structures for an element or any compound, and one of the early structures to be determined experimentally, does have a D glide in it. So the name of the compound diamond gave its name to the type of glide plane. <coughs> OK. 
Okay, I've got still 10 more minutes. What I would like to do next is to look at some of the other monoclinic space groups and also examine the way in which this information is presented for you in the international tables. So I've got a big fat pack of material that shows you all of the monoclinic space groups, that is the space groups derived from point group two, the space groups with point group M, and the space groups with point group two over M. And we've done a few of these, but what we haven't looked at is the Schoenfuis notation for the result or the way in which this information is presented in the international tables. To introduce you to these gradually, this is uh, the monoclinic space group. This, these are the monoclinic space groups as presented in the old international tables for X-ray crystallography. A little bit later, I will pass out to you a few higher symmetry space groups that are represented in both the old international tables and the new international tables. And as I indicated uh, somewhat disparagingly early on, there's so much information in the new version that they're very, very hard to use. But okay, if you open the handout, uh, you find plane group, space group P2. So that's a twofold axis added to a primitive monoclinic lattice. You see on the left hand page this situation, this ridiculous situation that exists only for monoclinic crystals. The first setting where the axes are A on the left hand side running down, B on the top running from left to right, and C coming straight up out of the page. And the second setting where the unique axis is B. And that means if you're going to draw the space group with C coming up, A down, and B to the right, um, B now is the direction of the twofold axis. So the diagram looks completely different, but it's the same space group, except that the first setting is tilted on its side so that A comes down, B is from left to right, and C, which is now not a direction of a twofold axis, comes out. So there's some jargon here, uh, that geometric jargon. The atoms occur at different elevations. So in these two cases, uh, the atoms occur only at elevations plus Z or minus Z. And you see next to the little circles that represent the symmetry equivalent positions for the general position, a plus, and that means elevation plus Z. And for the first setting, all the atoms occur at an elevation plus C for the general position. For the second setting in the right-hand diagram, you're looking at the two-fold axis from the side, and therefore one atom is at plus C. The one that's related by symmetry gets rotated down to minus C. So you see a little plus next to one atom, a little minus next to the one next to it. We need a symbol for a view down along the locus of a two-fold axis, and that's the little pointed oval that we became familiar with with the plane groups. Uh, when you're looking at the two-fold axis from the side, how are you going to indicate that? Well, the convention is to use an arrow, and that's what you see on the right-hand side for the second setting of P2. If this were not a two-fold axis but a two-sub-one screw axis, it would be a one-sided barb. So looking down at these two axes with rotations of 180 degrees, this is the symbol for two viewed from a side, and a one-sided barb would be the symbol for a two sub one screw axis. Mercifully, these are the only screw axes that need to be depicted in a view from the side. So there's no standard uh, symbol for a six-fold axis or a four-fold axis looked at from the side. In boldface, in the outer corner of these pages, you see the international symbol, which is what we used for the plane groups. Um, symbol for the lattice type, primitive 
except now we use uppercase symbols for the lattice type to distinguish the space groups from the plane groups. Underneath it, you see a C2 superscript 1. This is the Schoenfli symbol. You'll, you'll recognize C2 as the Schoenfli symbol for a twofold axis. Schoenfli's symbol for the space group was to add a superscript, namely the first one that old Arthur got, the second one that Arthur got from this point group, the third one he got from the point group, and so on. So it's pretty much an arbitrary order, except he starts with a, as you'll see, he starts with a twofold axis, then replaces the twofold axis with a screw axis. So if you turn to the next page, uh, you see symbols for not two-fold axes, but two sub one screw axes <coughs> along the edges of the cell. You see now a different sort of symbol alongside the atoms. Uh, there's one at plus Z, that's the representative one at XYZ. If you repeat it by a screw rotation, you rotate it 180 <coughs> degrees and slide it up by one half of C. So you see the symbol one half plus. So plus is plus C, one half plus is one half plus C. Um, over to the second settings. Try not to sneer too uh, vigorously. Uh, you see pointed barbs. Um, and that's the symbol for a two-fold axis viewed from a side. And uh, then um, one of them is plus. The one that's slid along parallel to the two sub one screw axis goes to the other side and goes from plus C down to the minus C. Let me ask you a question which people usually don't think about. If you look at the first setting and ask, what are the lengths of the translations? Well, that's A, and that's so many angstroms, and that's B, that's so many angstroms. If I ask you that for the second setting, the answer is a little trickier. What is the length of this translation? That's B. What is the length of this translation? I'm sorry, that's C, and this translation is A, right? Wrong. That is no longer A. And the reason for that is that when you have a cell with non-orthogonal angles in it, <coughs> let me indicate for the most general case for a triclinic crystal. So this is, uh, this is A, this is B, and uh, then the third translation normal to that plane is C. And if we have a structure with atoms in these locations, and we want to project the structure along C, you do exactly that. You don't plop the atom down onto the base of the cell when you project it, because if you did so, the atom that is up in the neighboring unit cell would come down to a different location. And you would not have a pattern that was periodic based on a lattice. You get that only if when you're projecting in an oblique lattice, you project along the translation. And then and only then can you end up with a pattern that looks as though it has translational periodicity and really does. So if a cell is oblique, you do not project just by plopping the atoms down on the base of the cell. You project them parallel to the translation that extends up above the direction on to which you're projecting. So if our cell in the second setting is monoclinic, and uh, this is A, and this is B, and C comes up, if we look at that cell from the side, as is done in the depiction on the right hand, um, then we let this be the direction of B, so that is B. Um, but the thing that is at right angles to B is going to be A times the cosine of beta and it's not A itself. Okay, so this is a right angle, but this is not the lattice translation. It is uh, 
the lattice translation times the trigonometric function. The triclinic case is a hairy beast. Uh, to calculate the length of these axes and projection, it's clear what they are, but to get these values involves alpha and beta and gamma, and it is a very, very complicated function. Uh, the angle between, depends on how you label your axes. For monoclinic, if you do the first setting, then by definition, this is A and this is B and this is C. So these are always, by definition, 90 degrees. If you use the second setting, then this is the direction of B and this is the direction of A and this is the direction of C. That keeps the system right-handed. Then this is a right angle and this is a general angle. Okay. No, I'm, I'm doing more than that uh, because if there were a two-fold axis, that would be the direction of the two-fold axis. Now this is the direction of the two-fold axis. Okay. Uh, <coughs> the other thing that happens is the symbols for the glides change. So if you look at, at uh, space group number seven, which is a case where the mirror plane has been replaced by a B glide in the first setting, and that means the glide is perpendicular to the twofold axis. If the twofold axis is, a, uh, is now the direction of B, the glide plane turns into a C glide. Okay, but let's, let's just sum through them quickly, and then we're actually two minutes past my promised quitting hour. Um, first one, P2. Then replace the two-fold axis by a two sub one screw. So that's Schoenfli symbol C2 superscript 2. Uh, then do this with centered lattices. The international table chooses to use a side-centered cell. So that's the third one you can get from a two-fold axis. So Schoenfli uh, calls it C subscript 2, superscript 3. And if you add that to a side-centered lattice, you get screw axes interleaved between the two-fold axes. Uh, put it on its side, it stays C2 superscript 3 in the Schoenfleece notation, um, but the side-centered B becomes side-centered C because it's B that comes out of the oblique net. So the international symbol tells you exactly what you have the Schoenfli symbol is arbitrary. It tells you the point group and it tells you the order in which Schoenfli derive them. But that non-informative nature to the symbol has a blessing, and that is it doesn't change with different labelings of A, B, and C. It doesn't change with A being shortest, B being shortest. Uh, it it it's a it just sits there in its dumb, uninformative fashion, and that is nice, so both of them are survived. Okay, uh, could we get a, uh, another space group out of this by replacing the two-fold axis by a two sub one? No, because we've already got two sub one screw axes in C2 superscript three. So then Schoenfleece moves on and uh, begins to work with symmetry planes. So number six puts a mirror plane in the primitive monoclinic lattice. Um, that becomes CS, that's the Schoenfli symbol for point group M, and it's the first thing you can get. Another piece of convention for displaying the representative pattern of atoms, uh, in the first setting the two atoms sit directly above one another. So there are two new things here. A vertical line through the atom indicates that there are two of them that are superposed in projection. And moreover, the little uh, tadpole has appeared inside the frog egg in the left-hand part. So this says on the right-hand side of that split circle, the atom is at plus Z. And the left-hand side with the comma to indicate an N antiomorph is one at minus Z that sits directly below the first one. And you notice in the diagram of the symmetry elements, there's a chevron working off the lower right-hand corner of the cell, and that's the symbol for a mirror plane that's being viewed directly from above. And then I'll just go a couple more. You can replace the mirror plane with a glide plane. 
and that's a B glide. Now you can see the atoms going up at plus C, slid along by one half Z and pop down to minus C, going to an enantiomorphism of a comma inside the circle. The chevron in the lower right hand corner of the diagram of symmetry elements now has acquired an arrow, a barb that indicates the direction of tau. <coughs> the uh, second setting Again, flops the thing on its side so that you're looking now down along the uh, B glide, and so you see a dotted line that indicates a glide plane viewed edge on in the direction of tau. Then you can put a mirror plane for number eight into a side centered B lattice. And uh, that gives you another space group. Uh, and then you can put a glide plane into the B lattice. And that, interestingly, gives you a different space group. Uh, the number eight has an alternating mirror plane with an axial glide. Number nine has an alternating axial glide alternating with a diagonal glide, two glide planes. Not a mirror plane and a glide, but two different kinds of glide planes. And then you've used up all the tricks you can pull there. So now we take the last monoclinic point group, 2 over m, drop it into a primitive lattice, replace the twofold axis with a 2 sub 1 screw axis that gives you p 2 sub 1 over m, then leave the twofold axis alone and leave the plane alone and put 2 over m in a side centered cell and then um, replace the mirror plane by a glide, that's number 13. And then finally, the summa cum ultra um, replace the two-fold axis by a two sub one screw and replace the mirror plane with a glide, number 14, and then do the same thing in a centered lattice. Um, so we get a total of 13 different space groups from two lousy kinds of lattices and three possible point groups. You get 13 different uh, distinct space groups. Okay, that's a quick overview. Um, notice that just as was the case for the plane groups, the tables go on to list the way in which atoms are related by symmetry and the number per cell and the site symmetry, just as in the plane groups and the way a three-dimensional structure is going to be described to you is exactly analogous to what we did with two dimensions. Magnesium in position 3B, symmetry uh, 6 over M. Uh, oxygen in position 12D, symmetry 1. And uh, then the tables give you the coordinates of all the symmetry-related atoms. Okay. Thank you for your patience. That was a long stretch in one shot. Um, I'll say a little bit, very little, next Tuesday about the Convention for Orthorhombic uh, Space Groups because there no one direction is any more or less special than any other. So the symbol for the space group changes all over the place when the axes take on different lengths, relative lengths, but the symmetry is exactly the same. So we'll spend